94.4 FM, South of City Radio, the Friday Sports Show with your host, Jim Petruzzi, bringing you all those news from all the local area and around the world. And today we have a very fascinating guest, a really, really interesting guest. But before we sort of do the build-up um, of our next guest, we've also been covering our segment, not necessarily our latest segment. It's been going for a while. Now we interview people in the field of psychology and related field. We've had some of the most influential people in the world of psychology been very privileged to have that as well as some great athletes sports people and it's always fascinating to hear what people have got to say um, based on their experience so they were a really fascinating guest i'm sure as listeners you're going to be really really intrigued he did his phd in philosophy was a professional footballer and and moved towards uh lecturing so alan tong welcome to the show great to have you on board hey jimmy okay yeah, no, fantastic. Take you on board, and you're, you're a lecturer now in, in football research at uh, UCFB, and the pathway for you to, to get there has been a, an interesting one. Yourself, obviously, playing uh, football at, um, at, at, a, at a very, very good standard, and um, you know, going on to do a, a, a PhD. Just tell us a bit, just for our listeners, in terms of where did it all begin for yourself, Alan, sort of your playing career? I mean, give us an insight into what happened there, because I think that sort of tie, obviously ties into your, to your PhD, but tell us a bit about so your playing career. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, like, like a lot of young people, I was, uh, you know, mad keen on football, you know, going, going right back into the early days, so I mean, then we sort of playing football with my dad and my dad, and about, you know, four or five years old, and, and, I, and I guess just, just having that sort of, um, that enjoyment and, and love of the game at an early age, and you know, I was I was fortunate in a way that it was you know football was something that I was I was quite decent at. I seem I to stand out a little bit in the yeah. uh, in the school playground, and you know, like a a lot of natural roots of, of young players. And I, I sort of ended up playing in, in grassroots teams, and then I went mm. to, to represent my town side, which was which was Bolton. Uh, I, ended, I ended up playing for Greater Manchester County, which is kind of the, the best players in the towns. Mm. And um, you know, fortunately enough, as, as my sort of journey went on, I was I was lucky to be picked up around 14, 15 by uh, by the Man United. The county invited me down to um, to United's old training ground, which was the Cliff at the time, to uh, to, to showcase my talent in, in front of Sir Alex Ferguson over over one Christmas time and. Luckily enough, I, I did well. I had a really good trial, and, and I got off the schoolboy forms and an apprentice. And uh, and on oh, leaving school, uh, Jimmy, that was my destination. I, I sort of finished my GCSEs mm. and head, headed into Man United full time as a as a young apprentice, a young scholar back then. So um, yeah, I mean that yeah, must have been no, incredible. No, 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 no. I mean it must have been really you know you know really fascinating and. Incredible, you know. Obviously, Alex Ferguson is he's, he's sort of, you know, if not the most respected manager of, in, in in football, and and you're there, and you're, you're a young lad. And what's it like to be in that environment at that age? Just for our listeners, Alan. I mean, sort of putting it into context. You know, you're a young lad there. You sort of, you know, one minute you're sort of playing in in you know, um, at sort of you mentioned there county level and 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 a good standard. But then you're at the, one of the biggest if not the biggest club in the world, and what's it like for a young person at age to be in that environment? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a strange one because, you know, I, I was, I was not, um, getting a bit of interest from other teams at the time. I was kind of like, my city had offered me the contract by schoolboy form, the Bolton Wanderers had as well, so because I was like, um, you know, all my family were United supporters and, you know, I was a sort of a, United fan myself, um, you know, when United offered me, there was kind of, I, I suppose, um, a natural sway to go and sign for them, a natural pull to them, because, you know, ultimately, uh, mm. you don't get that opportunity, it doesn't come out very often to, to get the opportunity to play for your boyhood side, and, you mm. know, and that, that was an absolute dream come through, and, and just, just going, going sort of, you know, a little bit deeper into the sort of situation I found myself in, I think, I think the culture back then, you know, was very, very different mm. than it was than it is at the moment. It was quite tough. It was, yeah. you know, you can't if you leave, you leave school at sixteen, and, and within, you know, within a, a few weeks, you're, you're training alongside, you know, men. You know, you love yeah, like yeah. Norman Whiteside back then, Brian Robson and Mark. Wow, yeah, you know, yeah. It, it was you had, you had to go quickly, and 
know, the apprentice days when I was coming through the system were a lot, a lot different to, to sort of to where they are now. Yeah, that's a great point. It's definitely something I want to sort of touch on um, in, in the interview because obviously times have changed. It's different. Um, we all have to adapt, and and like you say, it's you know obviously it's influential figures in in all of our life, and I think that the times have obviously changed, and and that's a really really interesting point. I don't want to touch on that uh, in the interview, but Exeter City obviously it's a different environment, a different part of the country, a um, whole different different place. I mean, describe what it was like to sort of to you know you probably couldn't go any further set up in some respects all the way down there what was the experience like and you know you sort of you're you know you're a northern lad so to speak at the point at that you know obviously northern um united fan and 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 sort of um you're down at exo what's what's the experience like down there uh alan yeah it was um you know a very a very very different culture a very very different environment you know we've been at united since i was 14 15 years old and I kind of, uh, I, left at, I left at 19, so I'd have like five teams. Uh, and what happened, Jimmy, when I was a young player at United, I got chosen to go play in a representative side in Russia, uh, which was representing the Football League. So I was um, I was only a first year apprentice, and, and it was, there was a lad called Alan Ball, he was like a sort of famous old player. He, he yeah, the World yeah. Cup with England in 1966. Well, he, he was leading the party along with another. Got an old manager called Laurie McMenemy. I think Laurie worked under Graham Taylor right, for, for a little while, three you know, yeah, yeah. years ago in the England set up. And, and those two lads were taking the party. So, so when I sort of moved on from United, Alan Ball was the manager at the at the time, and he, he sort of remembered me from that that game, and he, he said like he'd like to he'd like to offer me an opportunity and bring me down there to, to sort of uh, give, give me a chance to, to try and play some league football. So so that was. That was kind of how that worked out, and, and you're right. You know, at the time, actually, it was it felt as though it was on the other end of the world. You know, <laughs> yeah. growing up in Manchester all my life, and you know, growing up, I, I lived in uh, I lived in Bolton in, in a little village called Little Lever. Yeah, go yeah. from there and head down to Exeter, and sort of only 19. It seemed, it seemed forever, and um, you know, it was it was interesting, but. It turned out, you know, it was it was a really great time because I really enjoyed the time down in Exeter. It was, you know, I managed, like I say, to to get some league appearances in, and I managed to, to sort of get myself into the first team. Mm. Uh, I managed to score a goal or two in the, in the sort of football league. So I think it's, you kind of realise in another another dream in a way that that you, you're getting a chance to play first team football because I, unfortunately I just fell short at United. I think. Mm. It shows, Alan, in the way how fragile football can be in the sense that, you know, one minute you can be on the edge of a dream and, and sort of play for one of the greatest clubs in the world. And, and obviously, Exeter is, you know, a, a great club with a lot of pedigree and history as well. But United is obviously United for yourself, you know, being a you know, United fan and, and so on and so forth. But what it shows, like injury, loss of form, I suppose a lot of people listening to the show, um, especially the, the, the mental skills people will probably say luck is... But you do need a bit of luck every now and again. You know, obviously the injury comes into it and, and other stuff like that. But does it sort of how our fragile football can be? How I think, in, in certainly in my experience when I've done sort of coaching and stuff, it's... It's, it's difficult to get into the, the, the minds, the hearts and minds of, say, uh, 17, 18-year-olds to think that this might not last forever. Well, it won't last forever. It's short-lived, but you may not fulfil your dreams. I mean, does it sort of show just how, how football can be fragile? Oh, absolutely. You know, you, fo- fo- football is absolutely... It's, it's, it's riddled with challenges. It's riddled with ups and downs. You know, the, the ups are kind of, like you could recall... You know, doing well and scoring a goal, and you know, playing in the first team at Exeter. And you know, while I was at United, we, we won a couple of tournaments in the, in the youth teams, and we did quite well in the in the youth team league. And well, you don't you don't tend to recall the the ups as much as you should do. You tend to the, the downs are a lot more. Yeah, than yeah. It, you know, getting 
injuries and deselected and having having to make that transition from like you say from United like they were a, an absolute juggernaut of a football club with a huge global profile mm-hmm. to go to this little sort of you know club in Devon you know who have <laughs> an average of a few thousand fans a week at yeah. um, United at the time were averaging I think 40, 50 thousand a week and it's a massive it's a, it's a really really big step but but that's again it's, it's all about experience is an encounter and learning and, and sort of trying to, to sort of work out um, how you can improve and get better and, and mm. sort of you know like I say it, it's difficult to get into United first years. I think there's one thing you can be getting in the first team mm. but I think it's all mm. more even more challenging staying in it yeah I think. absolutely I think that's where a lot of young players kind of knock on the door and mm. well, unfortunately they, they can't they can't sustain and, or nail a place down and mm. uh, I think I think that's a really really difficult thing and uh, certainly at elite level football Mm-mm, no, definitely, and I think what's really interesting with yourself is obviously, um, I say obviously, I mean, th- th- I, I suppose there is a bit of a stigma in, in, in sport and football in terms of how, you know, we perceive, uh, how, how, the, how the, the footballers perceive education in terms of learning and, 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 and so on and so forth, and it's understandable to a point because I suppose that when you get a YT, uh, whatever it's called these days, um, you know, apprenticeship. And the first thing you want to do is sort of be a footballer. You might put sort of learning to the backbone and you really want to focus on your um, on, on, on trying to make it as a first-team player. But yourself, who went on to do a PhD, sort of shows that, you know, footballers are, are intelligent. They are, you know, um, not just intelligent. Um, obviously, you've got to be to, to sort of understand the whole dynamic and, and, and the, the, the process of being a footballer, but also academically. And where did, how did you turn your attention to, to, to doing academia, sort of getting the PhD? And I mean, that's a, that's a big achievement in itself. Yeah, well, I think the first thing, Jim, is like coming through the system. I, I, always, uh, you know, I always enjoyed learning right from, a, you know, right from primary school age. I think some people really... We don't like school, but, mm. you know, I, I was okay on in that respect. So, so what was quite bizarre is when I was coming through the schoolboy situation at United and then into the apprenticeship situation, I was absolutely amazed on how many players kind of really, you know, didn't do particularly well at school. And, mm. uh, you know, I, and I was always looking at me that I had that sort of, in the army as it were, where, if, if football kind of didn't work out, I always give a hundred percent to the courses that mm. you have to do at the club at the time. So the you know while I was at United, if you had to go to college one day a week. I think we still operate a similar thing now. Mm. And within that situation, um, quite a few of the lads, or maybe maybe you know um, a small number valued the education and got stuck into it, but quite a lot did. I think the biggest the biggest thing with that is if you forsake your education in relation to chasing or pursuing a dream of playing in the first team at United and it doesn't work out, I think that could be a real real impact to your identity. You know, you're, it's going to be a real challenge. Yeah. You know, with, with that impact to your identity, Jimmy, and having to come away from football and maybe look for something else to do, mm. you kind of not really engaged at school or you're not been bothered with your qualifications I think it's a bit of a dangerous game to play to be honest so, mm-hmm. so as, I, as, I come, as, yeah, as I come through the journey I think it was a bit of a strange one because I, I got to 22 years old and I had a real serious back problem that required a couple of operations and an intensive period of rehabilitation so unfortunately I had to retire at 24 so I was out of the game at 24 so so I had, mm. I had a couple of um, uh, qualifications behind me at that time, but I just felt very, very lost for a few years. I, I was at a funny age, I suppose, where I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do. Football had gone. Um, and I think the process didn't happen immediately for me. I didn't go back to university until I, until I was 28 years old. Mm. So I went through a series of jobs, first of all, and... And I think I think that series of jobs, Jim, was just to not try and bring away Jim, but I, it wasn't really fulfilling me. I wasn't realising my potential. So, so um, I think it was. Mm. Well, I think it was one of my family kind of said to me, "Did you, did you not fancy like upgrading your qualifications or adding to mm. your, you know, adding to your pro, your portfolio that you've 
somebody else. So I don't really consider it at the time, but mm -hmm. I think that that decision of going back to university to do a degree in sports science was probably, I suppose it was a bit of a light old moment and probably one of the best things they ever did in mm -hmm. pandemic. My life has kind of got on more of a stable footing. Yeah. So I think, I think that there's a couple of things to maybe look at here. Maybe at 24, I think the support from maybe, um, you know, people around the game, maybe club, maybe the BFA, mm -hmm. although they did help me out, you know, I'm, I'm not, I won't ever call the BFA because they were there, but I think I needed a little bit more where people sat down with me and said to me, you know, what skills have you got and what job could you mm -hmm. do in the future now that your football's finished? And I think for that few years, you're almost left to your own devices if they go and find something that you want to do and I, like I said I just felt a period of time really from 24 to 28 where I was just very very lost and unsure what what to do next and, mm. and like I said going back to going back to do that degree at 28 and then from then I did a teacher training qualification linked on to the to my degree so PGCE and then I picked up a master's degree in philosophy after that and then the education just kind of snowballed and, and like I said I've been I've been ed in education now for this is my seventeenth year of teaching, so it's gone really fast. But mm. I, I really, really enjoy what I do, and, and that is wrapped around experiences, wrapped around you know, getting myself a stable career, and I'm just trying to move my life on after the, the disappointment of retiring from, from professional football. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful stuff. And if uh, any listeners, um, we get obviously a lot of different listeners from all walks of life, and we do get yeah. people listening in who do play sports and football that's a, a take home message and just to sort of on that um on, on you mentioned the education for me and this is my just my opinion i'm you know this is just the way i see it um i've sort of delivered education to, to scholars um you know past and present over the years and i have to say um what you said is really important um message and and, and i feel certainly in my experience I've never really had an issue with any any of the scholars in the learning point of view. It's just about taking them to one side and explaining it and, and telling them that okay, you're learning because you know for your future and and you know you you might not make it here, but you could maybe get a scholarship in the states or you can progress. And and I think sometimes it's not even so much the the, the scholars. It's it's the fact that sometimes in years gone by when they are grouped from different teams at one college and the logistics. I think. In, in my opinion, in years gone by, and weren't always great. And I think this is not having our college lecturers. They do a great job of what they do, but the connection um, that they had sometimes, I felt, uh, with the scholars wasn't always great because it was more about getting the scholars through um, rather than sort of, you know, it's a holistic process, not just about yeah. ticking a few boxes and, and here's your certificate. You know, so it's, it's, you know, you learn. And do you think it's really important um, in terms of? Um, you know, you're an experienced lecturer now to sort of really connect with the learners and, and sort of know where they're coming from and be empathic with them. Absolutely, Jimmy, yeah. I think, I think that's huge. You know, all walks of life, isn't it? I think that yeah. if, you, if you can build a connection with somebody or, or you can sort of find some resonance between you and the, and the people that you're working with, you build that sort of trust. And I think within that trust element comes learning. You know, learning for me is, it's not, it's not meant to be a chore, it's, it's mm. meant to be kind of a, an enjoyable process where it's about growing yourself and, and developing yourself. And I think, I think with my sort of my football background and because I teach on football really big de degrees, I think that, you know, maybe that, that little bit of experience that I've had in the game has, has kind of helped me mm. get a little bit of respect and, and a little bit of, you know, that building those connections and, and relationships with the people that I work with. I, I don't think that's done me any harm at all. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that it's about try, trying to trying to weasel those past experiences that I've had and, and get like a positive sort of outcome out of it. Mm -hmm. So um, that that kind of um, sort of where I feel it's important sometimes, and and I think I think it's about. I think it's about knowing people as well and understanding people and realising that, you know, life is challenging, education is mm. challenging, and, you know, we're, we're on a tough journey and, and I think I think we're just trying to hopefully help point these young people and, and hopefully show them the importance of, of getting something behind them, like a degree or a mm. qualification, because 
because ultimately that qualification it might not lead them to becoming a multi-millionaire or it might you know it's, it's not a guarantee of getting you a job but it gives you a chance and that and that that's why mm. I always pass on to the people that I work with them it's, it's, absolutely it, it's about it's about arming yourself as best as you can and, and taking part in as much as you can you know, absolutely and, and over the last few years I've I said to the learners it's not just about picking up your academic qualifications as well it's about you know, putting yourself out there sometimes in voluntary positions because mm. ultimately the applied environment, whatever that may be, it might be as a coach or it might be as a performance analyst or working in radio. If, you, if you're not getting in with the tools and learning the on-the-job stuff as well, I think that's, that, that's hugely important too. So but it's, about, it's about trying to get involved with as much opportunities as you can to mm. grow your profile because ultimately as you go through the degrees you're in it, it sounds a bit crazy, but the people on your programme are all your competitors in a way. Yes. You're going to be going for the similar jobs, and, and, it, and it's about trying to just make yourself stand out a little bit and have something different mm. to somebody else. That, that's mm. kind of the message I try, I try to pass on in the learning environment. That's really powerful stuff, and I'm sort of sensing there on your sort of, you know, your early years at being at United, install that kind of winning mentality in terms of um, yeah. the way you see the world. Is that sort of a fair, a fair assessment, really, that the sort of five years at United and the Alex Ferguson experience, is, does that sort of rub off on you, do you think, in terms of... Oh, the absolutely. Mindset? Absolutely, Jimmy. I think when Sir Alex arrived, he United in November 1986, and, and you know, it took him it took him a number of years to try and get the club sorted out, but, you know, Sir Alex was, was absolutely huge on on standards and discipline and timekeeping and mm. and he, he introduced um, you know he, 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 he sorted the nutrition out he used to, he used to provide he asked the cooks to provide some porridge for breakfast for the younger boys and and I think I think it's it's experience in these lads like mm. Sir Alex and Eric Harrison and Alan yeah. Ball and you know a lot of Brian Kidd was a coach back then he, he still at the at the moment and and it's just learning from different people in, in how they operate. But you know, the the, the top of the pile for, for discipline and work ethic. And you know, Sir Alex. If you ask any of the players who played under him, I mean, he was first at the training ground every morning. Wow. So you could roll up. I used to roll up at sort of quarter past seven, half seven, because the, the apprentices had to come in and do the, some of the chat first of all. But his car would always be there. And what wow. he'd do is he'd stay there all day, and nine times out of ten unless he had commitments of his own, he'd stay on and watch the youngsters training in the evening as well and even sometimes get involved. Wow, it's like incredible. The 12, the under 13, the under 14, he'd go and have a look at them and, you know, he might not be leaving the training ground until 9, 10 o'clock at night. So, but it's just observing that sort of practice in action and then, you know, mm. not necessarily in a football context because unfortunately my career was over young, but applying that mm. insight and that, learning and that knowledge that I've picked up into another avenue or down another path mm -hmm. and that, 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 that's kind of what I've tried to do Jimmy as, as kind of my life and my career and, and, me, and me journey has panned out for myself. Yeah, that's really powerful stuff. And and just on the PhD, the sort of philosophy and and sort of what's your take on, on sort of the identity of, of, of sort of players, how um, you know, it may not be in the scope of your research, but I suppose from your experience learning and your own journey, um, I mean, how difficult is it uh, um, to, 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 to transition from, from being in that sort of environment? It's like a, a micro environment, then you're in that sort of big wide world, and all of a sudden your sort of identity is almost like stripped away, and, and it's like starting a new life, really, um, for a lot of footballers. Absolutely, Jim. And what, what I found in the research is I found that you kind of the, the the players who tend to have a, a broader identity, so they've got they've got kind of more things going on around them in their lives. That could be like you know family support mm. or education or or working with charities or trusts so outside of football. They tend to cope with the the difficulties a little bit easier than those who've kind of got what we call is a a kind of a very, very strong athletic identity. So, you know, a lot, a lot of lads who made the grade, of course you need a strong athletic identity for people to get into a, a career that uh, is ultimately, hopefully, going to be very fruitful for you. Mm. But, unfortunately, the data is very damning. 
Um, I think it was Michael Calvin who said, like, all the people who's in an academy environment at the moment, there's only 0.012% going to play in, like, a Premier League for first team. So, wow. <laughs> I think he, I think he, he, he put a, a sort of a, a comparison to that's like the same as getting hit by a bloody meteorite on the way. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. You know, like, yeah, so, so really damning statistics. So, so you've kind of got what I'd say is just try and you know broaden that identity on your journey and, and try and you know establish yourself with you know a few things that are options like it's just like a plan B in a way. So. Mm. I mean, yeah. but ultimately, you know, as, as you journey through the game, the academy and the pro environment are two completely different contexts, two, two completely different cultures. The academy environment, you know, you could be Mr. Big making the grade, you could be playing regularly every week, scoring loads of goals, and then suddenly you turn up in a pro environment and you're bottom of the ladder, you're down at the bottom. That, that's a threat to your identity. You know, you've got to try and prove yourself you've got to try and show what you're made of to try and get into that first team and stay in that first team. Wow. So there's a challenge. In the pro environment, the exposure, the prestige, the the, 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 um, um, the, the, the the football supporters, the media, you know, they're all interested in this new kid in the block. So again, that can, that can create difficult and challenging for you. And, mm. and ultimately, linked in with that, you might have injury, you might have selection to deal with. You might have to go away on loan to different clubs, you know, to, to try and establish yourself there before you get a first in the Premier League. It's mm. all these different things that are really, really challenging. Home fitness can be a big one, mm. you know, if you get away from family. So, so when I did my research and spoke to quite a number of professional players, it, it wasn't really a lot of mental skills stuff that was coming out, i.e., you know, what you're visualising before you go out to mm. play or, yeah, yeah. or how are you setting goals, you know, for the next six months and what, how it's going to be? It was more issues what we call like critical moments, like critical moments that create loads of existential anxiety that's, that's got to be dealt with. Um, um, critical moments such as, you know, di- different different topics and different things that, that present an opportunity for growth and learning, you know, and, and, and a chance to really, really strengthen your identity and, mm-hmm. and hopefully drive yourselves into the into the first team environment and stay in that first team environment. So, so yeah, lot, lots of different, lots of different, different challenges. Isn't it? Yeah, and that's really fascinating stuff. I think that you know it's really interesting stuff, and it, that's really you know some of the. You know, I mean, what are you speaking about there? On you know, any any young sports person, not just footballer, uh, even outside sport, the sort of you know process insight into into sort of identity how it sort of shapes our reality and 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 obviously what how it has an impact on on our behavior uh, and sort of moving forward in terms of yourself i mean this is sort of a hypothetical question um and it may sort of help our listeners get more of an understanding and insight in terms of yourself and how you developed into the, the role you're in now and and obviously, you know, you sort of mentioned the statistics of being a pro footballer are very slim and it's very challenging. If you were to go back and, and, and speak to sort of, you know, 19-year-old, uh, Alan, what, what would you sort of say in terms of any, any sort of words of wisdom you'd sort of give 19-year-old self as you sort of making your way in your footballing journey? Yeah, I think, I think it's it, it difficult, Jim, isn't it? Because, yeah. you know, it's, it's like you're saying you've got, you've got to grow up got to grow up quickly in these environments and, absolutely yeah and, and, and I think I think for me it's about if I could go back to my 19 year old self it, it'd probably be a little bit more maybe developing my personality a little bit more and becoming a little bit more vocal and maybe maybe a little bit more confident in my mm. own ability within that environment I was in mm. but I think that's a, re- that's a real challenge when you've got a you know, like a quiet dish or a shy lad, I think that's that, that's quite a difficult thing to do. But mm. but I think I think that's what you know. If you, if you could kind of turn the clock back and to myself, but but the thing is, Jim, I think all you can do is like say, well, I, I give it my best shot. Um, mm. I try my best. You know, unfortunately in life, things sometimes things work out for you, and sometimes things don't work out for you. Mm. It's about it, was it was it. Um, um, I'm just trying to think of the poet who said you should treat victory and, and loss mm. in both the same ways. Absolutely, so, yeah. 
I mean, that's sort of an existential way of, of sort of looking at, philosophical existential way of looking at things in terms of sort of meaning and, and, and certainly you can see yeah. with yourself, so, you know, the, 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 the sort of meaning and the philosophical yeah. um, outlook that, that you have. And I think the challenge is, in a way, that there'll be people listening to the show um, of all ages and, and, and perhaps sometimes, you know, I suppose as an 18, 19-year-old, unless you experience it, um, you can sort of tell people and they'll take what they want out of it and what maybe they need and they might take a few bits and pieces. But in the end, experiences are and have a big impact on the reality. Do you think there's a case for that? Just, you know, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that sometimes we can sort of create environments where we, we, we sort of try not to do our best not to let people fall, but it's through those falls if you can sort of cushion the blow is when they learn, yeah. so to speak. Uh, absolutely. I think I think in those days, you know, for me, they tended to be, you know, maybe managers and coaches maybe, maybe made a little bit more quicker decisions on whether you was going to be a first-team player or not. Mm. Whereas in the modern world, as science has improved, and as knowledge of talent development and, and talent sort of uh, promotion and, and patience and things like that, maybe I might have got another year into it in the modern day because... You know, the reserves back then that I played in was kind of, you know, you're 17, 18 years old, but you're playing in, like, men's teams, whereas in the modern world, football now has an under-23 side. So mm. so you might get till 2021 to, um, to see if you developed enough to maybe come into first-team recognition. Yeah. So I think, I think that's possibly, you know, one of the, one of the, um, the scenarios back then, how it was different. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, going back into my era as well, Jimmy, you only had, you were chasing an 11 plus 2 on the bench, so 13 in a squad, whereas these days you've got, you seem to have a lot more competitions, like the Carabao Cup and the, you know, the you're playing like the Football League Cup and the, you know, you might get an opportunity to show your wares in the first team, whereas back in my day there was kind of like, 20, 25 pros chasing 11 spots uh, mm. and only two on the bench whereas now you can get like five on the bench so yeah. so there may be squads have increased over this last period that that may allow younger players to sort of show what they can do as well so mm. so maybe that was a, like a little bit of thing but you know it, Jimmy honestly I, I, I take my you know the experiences I had I'm very proud you know I was at United for five feet I played in. I played with some fantastic footballers. I played with Ryan Gibbs. I played in the same team as Brian Robson, Norman White, sorry, Paul McGrath, and um, Dennis Irwin, Steve Bruce. You know, I, I was lucky. I was very lucky to get that. But some people don't even get, mm. you know, a trial. You know, absolutely. And I played in the football league for Exeter. I scored in the football league. So, so even though there is a massive and disappointment that it didn't quite work out you just got to sort of take it on the chin and live and let live and mm-hmm. you know I've, like I said I've, I've tried to I've tried to sort of deviate and divert into another career now that I, that I really enjoy as well so yeah and absolutely I, 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 I found myself really lucky I honestly do I yeah, honestly do you know it's, it's, it's a really interesting sort of uh, some really interesting points you've made there. I guess what sort of fascinates me, Alan, you know, people, you know, I mean, you know, obviously professionals like yourself, what really fascinates me is how, you know, you, you, you play and, you know, some, some really tough managers and coaches who set some really high standards and, and you've got players around you, like you've mentioned there, the, the Robsons, the, the Hughes, and, and, and these are people who sort of set really, really high standards, um, you know, really, really high standards. And and the the world sort of in some respects has changed place, you know. For one reason or the other, we've got new rules and regulations, and you know some for the better. And, and like all things, sometimes I think you know things are introduced, and maybe you know there's knee jerk reactions. And but obviously in in education as well, it's 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 the way we you know conduct ourselves as lecturers and and speak to learners, and that's changed a lot too over the years. Some for the better. Don't get me wrong, but. How is it to adapt when you when you when you sort of you're used to sort of being in an environment where you you you, you, you know the, the the most prolific manager of all time or at least of his generation who sets these really high standards 
uh, and then you're sort of thrust in a different world where, you know, don't get me wrong, the standards are high, but, but it is what it is. Obviously, you know, learners um, in general environments aren't sort of, in, in some respects, they've got their own aspirations, but it, the details aren't as fine as sort of being a pro football, one of the biggest clubs in the world. How do you sort of transition, Alan, to, to, to a new environment, new, new sort of eras that come along and, you know, new, new ways of being, really? I mean, if you think about it this way, could you imagine, you know, some of the young um, performers now or, or people at uni now being in an environment with, with a Sir Alex Ferguson? I mean, I know it would never happen, but hypothetically, could you imagine sort of being in that sort of environment where the standards are so high and there's just there's no no quarter given? No, I think I think you're right, Jimmy. I think back in the, the sort of the era that I played, and the culture was very different. I think I think maybe for me, Jimmy, in my humble opinion, it was it was too harsh. It was too yeah. harsh. But what we've got to be careful of here in the modern world, in the modern environment, what we don't want, we don't want the needle swinging too much the other way where the environment becomes too soft and too nurtured and too caring. Mm. So I think, I think in any elite level sport environment, the, the balance has got to be right. Yes. You know, you, you think, Jimmy, over in the news, in, within the news over this last sort of few, few months, we've had, we've had complaints from like cycling and gymnastics about harsh environments. They've been all over the news. And, and, yeah. You know, and it's, so, so there is, there is that element there that, that sort of, you know, the, the, the worry for me is, is kind of, some sports are so not quite getting it right yet. Mm. Because ultimately, ultimately, professional sports, tough, it's not easy, it's just absolutely hammered with difficulties and challenges, so you've got to be robust, you've got to be resilient enough to cope with that. Mm. So in order to cope with that, you've got to be, you've got to experience things as a player coming through the system that, that really challenges you, challenges you and really makes you think and grow and, mm. and battle on. And I think that sometimes we worry with academy football. I think it's a little bit too, maybe a little bit too comfortable for a lot of players. And then when, when it's in the first team world and all this, all this pandemonium's going on and the, mm. all, this, all this anxiety's cooking and the, the, a lot of players have not got the tools, unfortunately, to deal with it. Mm, mm. So, so that, that kind of, for me, is, 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 is um, as part of some of my PhD work, that's maybe something that needs looking at, mm. you know, in, in yeah, that'd be and, that, and, that is, and that is preparing football players in the best way that can be in order to make the transition into the first being environment. Yeah, and that, that's really interesting you say, and obviously you've been there, you've done that, you've experienced sort of both ends of the spectrum. You know, as a lecturer, obviously, you see, you know, the world really well aware of the world, uh, you know, around you, and obviously, you know, like you've mentioned there, yeah, you know, perhaps it was too harsh at the time. But then in saying that, it's something I've sort of thought long and hard about. I've not done any sort of official studies and just anecdotally, just through my own journey, speaking to people like yourself. And I, I sort of look at people like yourself and the professionals who've sort of been on their journey, um, who've been involved in environments that obviously the attention to detail is sort of, uh, is sort of incredible in terms of what the expectations are, and and but then I, I look and think, okay, um, you know, some of you guys have sort of you've gone on to do really well in some respects, and and sometimes I look at I mean, that's not having a go at young people these days. They do a great job, and and don't get me wrong, it's sort of you know it's it's hard to compare different areas, but then you see people who are in environments where it is you know sort of <laughs> molly coddled and, and and softly softly, but. It doesn't really yeah. prepare for reality. Um, is, is there a case for that? Do you think? You know, that. that yeah. 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 Uh, I, I, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think it. I think it's about like I say. I think that key word for me, Jim, is balance. Is getting yes. the balance right. It's getting the balance between developing your skill set, developing your football ability, developing you socially, developing you psychologically. So, so you've got the best chance possible in making the step from the the kind of supportive environment that you find in most academies to the, to the absolute, you know, sometimes carnage in the first team world where <laughs> yeah. you know, you're, battling, you're battling for places, you, the newspapers are interested in your development, you're all over social media, um, you're in and out of the team, you know, there's, there's demons all over, all over the place for you and, and I think it's getting that, it's getting that sort of that ability to, to almost adapt and, and cope with it that really, really separates the ones that, that kind of get a good career 
or they get an unbelievable career. I think I think that's that sort of uh, needs to be maybe looked at in the, in the journeys of players and, and how they are how they are sort of supported and, and how what sort of learning that they go through mm. in order to make that transition as, as easy as possible. Because because ultimately, like, like you say, there's a couple of years going from a schoolboy to an apprentice, and then an apprentice to a pro, pro to a first team player, first team player to a sort of a Mm-hmm. Um, 24, 25, 26 year old, so like a, you know, like a middle years pro, and then, you know, if you're lucky enough to become a senior professional and you get to 30 plus, mm-hmm. so there's, all these, there's all these little series of transitions that are going on, and then ultimately, at the end of your career, whenever that happens, there's all the big transition then, is coming away from the game, or, or, you know, for a tiny, tiny percentage of players, maybe try to stay in it at some level, so I mm-hmm. think that, that's another sort of transitional uh, challenge that, that the players face, you know, when they when they come away from the sport. Mm. Um, some are lucky; some can get full careers, six hundred appearances. Some are not so lucky; they might be coming away from the game at nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. Injury can strike any time. Mm-hmm. So, I'd like to see maybe a little bit more support for those types of players as well. In face that, I know there's, there's been some great work going on um, yeah. over this last year or two with. Businesses and companies called like Life, Life After Professional Sport. I've seen yes. the play. I've seen the PFA are doing more work to get more knowledge and understanding of that difficult step as well. Because mm. I think I think that's what I've currently like tried to sort of look at in my PhD, Jim, is all the experiences mm. that you feel you've had where you just get left in the lurch. And I think it's a really difficult time for a professional athlete when you have to come away from the sport. Mm, absolutely. You really, you really need to. You really need to consider that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, the thing is too yeah. that you mentioned there. It's really interesting. I, I, I suppose if you sort of we, we can, if we went back, say maybe 20, 30 years in the game, you know, there were players who'd sort of played maybe five hundred games, if not more. And, and 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 don't get me wrong. Obviously, you know, from a wage point of view, they they had you know good wages compared to, 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 to the general uh, wage but it still probably wasn't enough to sort of set you up for life for some players and I mean these days you know you've got maybe 21 22 year olds who play at the highest level um, very very small percentage obviously um, they could literally retire now and what I'm getting at do you think sort of the finances had a big impact on, on, on players too in terms of the way they set themselves up afterwards and I mean there are players that will never have to think about they can sort of, you know, live off their earnings uh, forever uh, going forward at the highest level. Is money coming into the game changed things too, do you think, Alan? Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, you know, and I think I think what a lot of people sometimes don't do, you know, this is, this is not for open anybody, this is just the way the world is, but mm. you forget that there's Championship League 1 and League 2 and sort of National Absolutely, League, National yeah. League 1. And then there, there's a lot of professional land in there as well, you know, earning earning wages from time, you know, you, can, you come away from this massive juggernaut of the Premier League, but you know you, the further you go down the league system, the, the wages are getting less and less. The mm. disparity, the difference between a top Premier League player and a League Two player, could be you know absolutely thousands and thousands of pounds. Absolutely, so, yeah. But I think you know they they tend to get forgotten about the, the League One, League Two lads because ultimately they're they're up there more you know closer to you know they're going to have to look or think about a second career than. Than maybe an elite level player would, you know, an elite level player has maybe a little bit of time to to think about their next move. I know a lot of the top lads invest in in maybe restaurants or mm-hmm. businesses. Whereas you come down the leagues a little bit, you go into League One, League Two. You know, these lads are going to seriously consider either doing something to stay in the game, giving the best opportunity that they can to do that, or thinking about even a, you know another career choice.
Absolutely. You know, seven, eight, nine years old in the academy, and all of a sudden they get to 28 and they got injured or the contract run out and it's not got renewed and they can't get fixed up with another club and you're thinking, well, you know, where's, mm. where's the income coming from? Where's, where's my other where's mm. my other journey going to start now? Because you know, if, you, if you think about it, they say you're a league one player of 750 quid a week mm. and then that doesn't work out and you think, well, yeah, you can stay in the game, but if you go and coach the under-14s, you know, the wages for that is like 250 quid a week. It's, it's quite a substantial drop, so, yeah. so it's like, um, it's, it's adapting to that as well. So it's, it's all these challenges and these difficulties and these, and these times, Jimmy, that, that really make you think and, and, and really make... Yeah, know, absolutely. No, that's a plan for your next steps is, is really important. I think, I think the PSA, you know, and... and Clubs especially have got to really drive this home, especially to lads who are sort of coming to the end of careers and, and looking at the next, the next options and the next step. Yeah, and that's a really great point. And it's really interesting you say. I mean, I, I'm sort of not going to, you know, name, name the team. I was sort of um, covering um, some education for for a team uh, a year or so ago. It'd been a long time since I sort of um, did the education uh, uh, for for any team. But obviously, you know, my experience in in sort of teaching and I, I was a fit for that. But for me. Not a great deal had changed in the sense that I felt that the, the, the young players, the scholars, uh, yeah, I mean, the course was great that they were doing. It was, was you know, the course was, was okay. But there was still no real, from what I could see, anyone talking about, say, you know, finances, career choice, and, and just telling them the stats that, you know, the chances of making it and, and maybe telling them that there's options out there. You could do a scholarship somewhere. And I sort of sat down from one afternoon and I just felt, you know, almost like obligation to have a heart to heart and say, look, guys, you know, because it was coming to that release stage. And at that release stage, a lot of them don't want to do the edge. Well, I say a lot of them, at least in that experience, they want to carry on. Therefore, what's the point of doing the, the, the BTEC, whatever it is, I'm going to get released anyway. But, you know, you sit down with them. Just, I suppose, are there, are there outlets for them to, to talk to that you know of, Alan, in terms of, you know, that they can sort of speak to and say, well, okay, I'm feeling anxious. Um, I might not get taken on and what should I do and you mentioned you know there's some outlets now but uh, is that something you think that's from your experience that, that has developed over the, over the years and what could we do in, in that area yeah I, th- I think for me Jim I think what I've got to do here is I've got to bring the point to the full I, I was like that I, I was like that at 17, 18 I thought football was going to be world for yeah, yeah. and and I think, like you said, you know, great point. I think it's, it's driving that message home. And, and uh, if you need to do it, uh, 17, 18, 19, right, you need to do your qualifications, you need to do this, you need to get a second career lined up. I, I wouldn't have been listening to you, because yeah. you're, just, you're, just so, you're just so absorbed and so Absolutely. tunnel vision and so focused on becoming a footballer that, that you kind of pay lip service to the other things that you should be paying full attention to. So... So I think that's really important, and, and I just I just want to give I just want to give um, a, a good friend of mine. He was an apprentice with me at Man United called Simon Andrews, and mm. Simon set up a little business, a little company called Players Net. Yeah. And what they do is they, they mop up and catch all players who have been deselected within academies or players who have problems right mm. from under nines, right through to sort of under eighteens, under twenty ones, under twenty threes. Mm. And and, um, and Simon set that up with an absolutely fantastic fellow called Pete Lowe, and Pete was the mm. education manager of Man City. I think I think Pete was there mm. for 15, 16 years, something like that. So mm. there's an option. Uh, yeah, you know, no, that's interesting. Like stuff. Players or parents who have problems to contact players net, and that's another good one as well. So it is happening. It is yeah. getting better, but I still think the PSA do some brilliant stuff, but they, they still can do some more. I think. Yeah, so it's one of them, really. I suppose I'm, you know, I'm, I'm only speaking anecdotally, and I don't know the, the, the big picture there. And but you know, obviously, just just sort of my uh, take on it was that, you know, I, I looked at the the scholars that they, they were coming to the point where there was decision time. They're already anxious anyway. At the college, they're doing their their, their, their BTEC. You got the college teachers sort of. On, on their on their back and I suppose rightly so to a point about doing the work and submitting it but equally I'm sort of thinking to myself and I spoke to one of the, the, the lecturers then said well you know some of these guys are in a situation where a lot of all that they've sort of the vision they have for their life all hangs in the balance 
and and keep yeah. in mind that you know, I don't, you know whatever the, the right terminology is these days, they're, they're young people, or you know, I was going to call them kids then, but they are young people. They are 17, 18 is 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 young, you know. To yeah. it's, it's a big decision, and 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 I think you know the more support they've got to just even to speak to, um, to 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 take away that sort of some of them that bravado yeah. and. When you know sometimes their behavior is just an expression of what they're fearing really um, yeah. you know could happen but but people like yourself with your experience I think is phenomenal because you've been there and, and they can relate to that uh, you know going yeah. forward and I think you highlight um, there is a future outside football uh, is, is there a sort of take home message you give any young players who probably think well there's no rule you know there's nothing outside football and um, obviously yourself, you've, you know, you, you're a testament to what you can achieve uh, outside the game. Yeah, I, th I think, Jimmy, I think, you know, we've done a little bit of sort of like, um, you know, cultural comparisons within, within the you know, and so. but I think, I think for me personally, I think there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, more, there's a lot more options now for a younger player if it, if it didn't work out at 18, 19, you know, when I was, when I was, um, you know, deselected or injured, when I had the injuries at 22, 24 years old, the degree provision in the university, if you wanted to go, that was still quite low. I think they were, you know, you, you sport science was just coming into the fore, but, mm. you know, if you look at the, in the modern university system, like, you've got degrees in sports psychology, you've got, you've got degrees in performance analysis, you've got degrees in coaching, degrees in football management. Mm. So I think I think there's a lot more options now, and I think I think as well, Jimmy, in the modern world, I think there's a lot more global opportunity as well. Absolutely. If you want to move away, you know, I think I think <laughs> moving to Exeter City was a long, yeah, yeah, yeah. a long way for myself, but, yeah, but yeah. now you've got you've got like scholarships in America that are being offered. Yes. You've got opportunities to go and play in the Scandinavian countries, in the in the Swedish leagues or mm. the Icelandic leagues, or. So I think I think within the football circle there's a lot more broader options than I have. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I think still though when you when you kind of have that that real disappointing deselection experience or if you have it, I think it just gives you an opportunity just to take a step back and think about you know what is it that I really want. Mm -hmm. You know there's 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 a, there's a reason there is a reason you've got to be honest with yourself why you've been deselected. Mm -hmm. you know, if you gave that you needed to work on more, was it your social skills needed to be worked on? Mm. So, so you can you can look at yourself in depth at that time and think, right, what is the best way to move myself on forward if you're going to try and get another chance somewhere else within football? Or what skills do I have that I can maybe shoot on myself into another career? Mm. You might fancy becoming a coach, or you might want to stay in football or an analyst or a, or a sports scientist or a strength and conditioning coach, I think you've got to really, really think about what you want to do and then, just like football, drive that dream, Jim, and become that person mm. later on down your life. Absolutely. That's a great sort of, you know, take-home message for any, any young person listening, anyone at any age, uh, you know, listening to this, you know, parents who listen to the show and, and, and sort of teachers and coaches and sort of they can reflect on that and think, okay, um, you know that difficult time of year in football where big decisions are made, and and equally throughout the season, big decisions are made. Players are released, and we've seen players as well who've had successful careers in in the game, um, hundreds of league games, and, and have been told there's no place for you anymore, and and that's sort of a big deal as well in terms of you know um, you spend many years at a club and. And obviously, you know, you're on the way. It's, it's, it's you know, not needed. And they, all these things can be really difficult to cope with, for sure. And I'm sure the scope of your sort of PhD, you know, goes into more detail and it's really fascinating. But it's been really interesting um, speaking to you. And I've really enjoyed uh, speaking to you. And I've learned a lot myself. And that our listeners as well have sort of um, taken a lot away uh, from, from, you know, your insights. So... I really want to thank you, Alan, for coming aboard the show. Um, it's been fascinating, uh, to, to say uh, you know the least. Really, really fascinating uh, stuff. So thanks, Alan, for coming aboard the show. Absolute honour, Jimmy. Thanks so much for you know for inviting me on to come and have a chat and discuss some football for the for the sort of past hour. I've really enjoyed it, Jimmy. So thanks so much for that. 
Fantastic. That was Alan Tong. Really fascinating interview. PhD in philosophy and a lecturer in, in, in research um, at UCFB at the moment. But how fascinating was that in terms of anyone in football, outside football, in sport, to sort of hear about how sometimes we just readjust the sails in, in life and, you know, get some meaning and keep going. And the Friday Sports Show, 94.4 FM, with your host, Jim Retruza, bringing you all the news from the local area and around the world. Thanks for listening.